This is Rob Johnson, President of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. I'm here today with Dr. Glenn Hubbard from the Columbia Business School, who's formerly worked in George H.W. Bush's administration and in the U.S. Treasury. And secondly, he was the head of the Council of Economic Advisors under George W. Bush, H.W.'s son. He, from my perspective, has a tremendous awareness of both the nature of markets and economics, the history of economic thought, as well as a deep comprehension of that intersection and inseparability between politics and economics. He has a new book that's coming out that is absolutely extraordinary. Yale University Press has talked about it and John Lennon used to sing about it when he wrote his Walls and Bridges album in 1974. Glenn, I, uh, how to say, I was inspired to learn of what you were writing, but as I read it, I became more inspired. And I want to thank you for joining me today. And uh, I know my young scholars will be very deeply nourished uh, by our conversation. Well, thanks, Robin. Thanks so much for having me. What, uh, in, you know, I, I really like to start with, you're looking at the world. You have a lot of awareness and intellect and experience and scholarship, all, all the, all, like all these receptors, I'll call them. What inspired you to write this book and this message right now? And then we'll talk about what, what is within the message. But what, what was your, what tickled your fancy, made you reach into yourself and go after this book? Well, thanks. I think it's a great question. You know, one of the reasons I became an economist was I actually believed what classical economists and Enlightenment thinkers like Adam Smith believe in mass flourishing in a society. And it requires no deep insight on my part to observe that we're not seeing mass flourishing right now in society. Uh, I saw this up front uh, close and personal as an economist in George W. Bush's administration. You know, I led a battle against steel tariffs. Mm -hmm. The president made the opposite decision. He told me, perhaps just to be nice, that he wasn't disagreeing with me on economics, but he felt I had the wrong idea. I had all of these ideas about maximizing national income, but what was I going to say to people in Wheeling, West Virginia, or in other places? That put me on the road to thinking about things in a different way. Uh, I've taken MBA students over many years to parts of a heartland that have been left behind by change. And economics really does have an answer here. It goes back to Smith. And it's not capitalism versus socialism. It's walls and bridges. There's the seduction of the wall. If you don't like change, whether that changes from technology or globalization, we'll build a wall. We'll, we'll lock it out of your life. We'll make it 1955 again, if you'd like. That doesn't work. It never worked. Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations to say that idea was crazy and, and doesn't work. Yet, doing nothing isn't the answer either. The modern Smith would build bridges, helping people compete, helping people to adapt. There are tangible things government can do, business can do, and individuals can do. That's the debate we need to have. The, Antidote to the wall is the bridge. And let's let's. Uh, I want to I want to add a little more nuance or texture. What's a wall and what's a bridge? It, how do they differ? Well, I think of a wall as uh, sand in the gears for change. So it could be literal. Uh, go back to Roman times. The idea of building a wall to guard against the other. It could be um, metaphorical that will simply block out or high tariffs in trade against other parties. Smith, when he wrote The Wealth of Nations, was reacting to mercantilism, which was the standard economic view of the day. Trade surpluses are good. The purpose of the trading system is to bolster the gold and silver that the sovereign would have to fight wars and personal luxury. Smith stood all of that on its head, said, no, 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 no. It's consumers, it's average people that are the center, and the wealth of a nation is their ability to consume. 
And that ability to consume needs efficiency. It needs openness to change, whether that's to trade or the adaptation and adoption of new methods. That's a very important method. But you know, when economists have talked about that for generations, and I've written a freshman textbook, so a lot of people hear my own views on this, we talk about the gains from openness, and we do also at least mumble that there are people left behind as a result of that openness too. Winning on average doesn't mean that everybody wins. And there's always the expression that gainers can compensate losers. But the question is, do they? And how do they? And that's why we're in a thicket of populist wall discussions uh, and, and discussions of you know, trying to protect people as opposed to empower people to compete. Mm. Uh, so in one sense, the wall is just trying to stop the transition. The bridge might be to use public resources to, to facilitate the transformation and bring them along with the higher level of prosperity. Exactly, because if we stop the dynamism, to use my colleague Ned Phelps, Nobel Laureate yeah, yeah. economic yeah, term, to use Ned's term about dynamism, if we stop that, we are literally killing the golden goose of our future prosperity. And one shouldn't believe populist demagogues who say, well, you know, we can just shave a little bit off the margin, a little bit off that dynamism. We don't want to do that. At the same time, we do have to be prepared to help people compete. Now, you mentioned government. Again, I don't think of this as capitalism and socialism or welfare versus no welfare. It's what you want government to do. So two big examples I use in the book were the genius of the land-grant colleges in the Morrill Act. Mm -hmm. Lincoln, in the middle of the Civil War, believed that we needed to jumpstart opportunity. The nation was making a transition from agrarian to manufacturing and commercial. It needed help across regions to do that. It needed to be able to prepare people. Franklin Roosevelt had a similar insight with a GI Bill. With all of these soldiers returning from force to the United States, how would they be prepared to compete in the new economy? So government doesn't have to provide uh, extra welfare. It doesn't have to own things in a socialist model, but it does have to be a battering ram for opportunity. Smith himself saw that in the Wealth of Nations when he talked about the importance of infrastructure and public goods and education. His economy, of course, was much simpler than ours. The Smith today would be more focused on a, a bolder use of government, but in the way Lincoln or Roosevelt might have done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in the spirit of uh, transformation, the disruptions that have been with us are globalization and technology. And so I'm going to ask you kind of two questions, because the one on the horizon is climate change. What should we have done? Uh, let, me, let me back over a second. I've made a lot of podcasts with people about what's going on in West Virginia, Bob Pollan and others. And they say, in West Virginia, if you're watching social media, people will say, perhaps sponsored by the fossil fuel industry, look at what they did to Cleveland and Detroit. They went through that change, globalization, automation, what have you, and you got nothing. That's what they're getting ready to do to you, because they're trying to mobilize, which you might call more support against the transformation. And my intuition as I was listening to these arguments is you're right that we didn't succeed in Cleveland, Detroit, or what you might call the automotive transformation. But what do we do now, credibly, for the people of West Virginia? So that's the forward-looking the slightly, or I wouldn't even call it backward looking, the contemporaneous look is how with globalization and how I grew up in Detroit. I, I watched people talking about you can't raise taxes, you've got to reschedule in the Detroit bankruptcy what's happening to women who've worked 45 years in municipal government. We're going to cut their health care, we're going to cut their pension from 19000 to 12000 Bankruptcy in the private sector when you don't have revenue. Bankruptcy in this context, which was authorized by the courts, is when 
People are afraid to ask people to pay because they think they're going to leave the region. What do we do right now? Looking at what happens with globalization and technology, what do we do vis-a-vis -vis climate change is the one making everybody most anxious now. What does the bridge look like that we should have done? What does the bridge look like we should do next? It's a great question, Rob. If you go back, what we should have done is remember the admonition that Nicholas Caldor, a great economist, had said that when you're making a change, it makes us on average better off. And by the way, globalization and technological change do that. They mm -hmm. make us better off. We should not ever forget that. You need to compensate people left behind. And what Calder meant was not write people a check or pension them off. He meant in Smith's sense, you know, giving them that ability to compete. So we had programs going back in the day from the late 60s on uh, called trade adjustment assistance. Mm -hmm. They're pennies on the dollar. They were nothing. In fact, politicians rarely even spoke of them unless they wanted to expand trade agreements. We could have had bolder initiatives. And in my book, I mentioned the idea of applied research centers to, to borrow from the Land Grant Morrill Act colleges, uh, a block grant for community colleges, which nationally are the foot soldiers of training people for a different economy. Both of those ideas, like the Morrill Act, build on the need to make decisions at the local level. There isn't a one-size-fits-all problem mm -hmm. and solution. Mm -hmm. Detroit is not the same as Youngstown, which isn't the same as Wheeling, West Virginia. We okay. need to let local business people do it. Now, we know it can happen. So Pittsburgh is an example of a city and area that did, in fact, reinvent itself. The mm -hmm. steel industry's demise was uh, met with a big investment in education and healthcare. Yes, in the case of Pittsburgh, that was led by local business people who were trying to make that pivot. I don't think we can count on that everywhere. I do think government has to provide regions that means. So economists used to be very suspicious of um, what you might call place-based aid. We used to say, well, you should just move people to wherever the jobs are going to be. Well, for a variety of reasons, people aren't moving. Mm -hmm. And we do need to think about communities that are distressed and giving them the chance to adapt to new industries. So that takes me to West Virginia. So you could be forgiven in West Virginia for not worrying why am I not going to meet the fate of Detroit or Youngstown. And I think the idea is not to promise people that we're going to continue to use a lot of coal forever. Because, you know, frankly, we're not. It doesn't matter whether you're coming at it from solutions from the left or the right. And I'll come to those in a moment. That's not going to happen. But what you can say is what are ways we can prepare you for a different economy? And I think there are abundant ways to do that. Again, it goes back to the kinds of training programs and place-based aid and luring luring businesses. You know, climate change is a great example. What government should do and could do is use a price on carbon as a way to get business to innovate. Business is more efficient at deciding how we're going to decarbonize than government. Mm -hmm. But businesses aren't necessarily going to come to that on their own without the incentive of a price on carbon. So you need both. And it would be entirely appropriate to use some of the revenue from a carbon tax to fund transitions you know, mm -hmm. so that individuals and areas are there. And I use the word transition guardedly because, you know, one of the things I learned in researching the book, to my chagrin, talking with a lot of people affected by change is, you know, they're just alarmed when economists refer to things like transition costs. Would you like to be called a transition cost? I don't think I would. Yeah, yeah. I think I'd rather believe that I'm a human being with hopes and aspirations, and maybe I'm not going to be a great entrepreneur, but maybe I have my own aspirations. Mm -hmm. And I think that that kind of dignity goes very much back to Smith, the Smith of the theory of moral sentiments, and economists lose it at their peril. So I think we have answers going back, and we have answers going forward, and walls I know will fail. Bridges, I believe, can succeed. Mm -hmm. Well, I think there was a key word you said at the outset. When I, you, you said technology and globalization can make us better off. 
I agree with that as long as us is defined correctly. Who is us? Because a lot of people experience being outside of us, like you said, called the transition well, exactly. cost. And we've got to we've got to establish in the private sector, and we're watching a lot of evolution towards multi-stakeholder awareness, ESG kind of work and so forth. We gotta understand that the dynamisms which am I call vitality and possibility is at risk at this juncture of social rebellion. That is exactly the case, Rob. I think too often business leaders and frankly economists as well assume that social support for the system or capitalism is given and then we just use policies to tweak it around the edges. I think that's up for grabs. Mm -hmm. I mean, even teaching in a business school, I have many students in political economy who would question whether capitalism is really working for the economy. And they would raise it in the same way you did of who's us. So if your definition of us is all of us on average, it's definitely working. But of course, none of us is exactly average. Some of them, hopefully including all my students, will be decidedly above average. Same is true of you and, and of me. But it's not true for everybody who's influenced by change. Yet we all are part of the same community. You know, another thinker that I, I mentioned in the book is uh, Carl Polanyi, who, who mm -hmm. talked a lot about markets as needing to realize that there's a tissue, if that's the right word, of connection from communities and values. And, and you can't operate in the neoliberal way that the market system totally away from those communities. So I think that the debate is much more subtle than this capitalism socialism debate in Washington and much more about what kind of bridges can we devise mm -hmm. to beat the wall flavor of the month. And the left has its walls, the right has its walls, but they're all harmful. Yeah, I, I'm sure you'll understand what I'm saying. Um, years ago, when Occupy Wall Street was unfolding, a friend of mine the late James Cohn at Union Theological Seminary challenged me to come teach a thing I called, the title of the course was Economics and Theology to the graduate students. And I, I, my code word for the, my code phrase was means and ends. And what I was trying to show them was why people at that distressful time were so adhering to the market logic, but they'd almost made an error in, in deifying the market as opposed to seeing it as a tool to reach moral and philosophical ends, of which it is a very valuable tool. And it was very interesting to watch them unfold and also see the promises. I. Uh, remember teaching them a book by a famous author, Christopher Lash, called uh, The True and Only Heaven. And it was about how when you tell people to delay gratification, meaning wage demands, it creates capital formation and productivity for the future. But Lash, who wrote the book in the late 80s, came with a very interesting perspective, which was that was working until there was globalization. Because now in that 70s, 80s period, which you refer to in, early in the book about, you know, when you began your awareness and education, people started asking you to delay gratification for foreign direct investment that came back to compete with you and which am I called that salvation in the future, that secular salvation was postponed or eradicated. And there's also a lot of discussion in that course about Martin Luther King, A. Philip Randolph, and others who didn't go out and create a civil rights budget. They created something called the Freedom Budget for All Americans. In the last three years of his life, King spoke of racism, materialism, and militarism. And in particular, they were advocating, rightly or wrongly, that militarism was eating 
a big hole out of things that all Americans would consider essential to their well-being. And so I, I watched the kind of mindset and I invoked chapters from the theory of moral sentiments to go to the place where you are right now, which is at the Union Theological Seminary. The market wasn't a deity that you had to get out of the way of. It was a vital and important part of a process toward achieving social ends, which the early Adam Smith articulated and which you're bringing back to the surface. Well, I, I very much agree with that, Rob. I also think it's um, something perhaps more subtle that economists and sometimes policymakers treat this market worship as a very technocratic set of problems. So you mentioned Occupy Wall Street. So mm -hmm. the view of the bank bailouts at the time were that you know they were very important for the plumbing of finance and the economy. And I share that view. I shared it and share it today. Mm -hmm. At the same time, our failure to do other things, a colleague of mine, Chris Mayer, and I wrote a proposal in mm. 2008 for a mass refinancing of home mortgages. Once all the credit risk had been taken on to the mm -hmm. government's balance sheet, mm -hmm. when Paulson did, Secretary Paulson did so for Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, we didn't do that. And so you could forgive a lot of average people from saying, you know, huh, how come? Wall Street got bailed out, but yeah. I got stuck paying mortgage payments that were very high. And it really undermines this trust in the system. You know, I thought yeah. the most um, thoughtful comment during the financial crisis actually came from the Queen of England. When she said, yeah. why did nobody see it coming? Yeah. She said it to a group of faculty at the London School of Economics. I expect with a little bit of regal condescension that you guys are so smart how come you didn't see it coming? I'm glad she didn't come to Columbia because I would have been just as embarrassed probably <laughs> as the LSC colleagues. And I think part of the answer is we don't get out much. You know, Smith did. He talked about a pen factory, for God's mm, sakes, mm. not abstract mm. intuition. Uh, we need to get out and see the concerns of average people and of average business people rather than retreating to worship of uh, the equations of the market. Yeah. Well, I know because of my proximity here in New York to Columbia University that you and people like Ned Phelps, who you mentioned, and Joe Stiglitz and others nourish one another. There's a dynamism oh, to great. the debate yep. there. I just went to Ned's conference recently uh, and, yes, and experienced it was a great that conference. energy. Yeah. And, uh, yep. and, it, and it was a very open-minded conference about the challenges. and the, 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 It wasn't a defensive, you know, Circle My Wagons conference. These people really high caliber. Eric Maskin, everybody was going for it. Right. And, but I remember when Joe and I were working on a UN Council on uh, Commission on Global Economics and Finance 2010, 29, 2010. And Joe said, we're going to have a real problem. It became a famous quote because the polluters are getting paid. He was drawing an analogy to climate change, which was we bailed mm -hmm. out the people, but we didn't do the transformational things. And, and by the way, that part, I know you worked with uh, Paulson, you worked in the Bush administration. That part was largely the responsibility of the, of the Obama administration. Right, of course. And, and they didn't realize that, which you might call fairness or distributional vision. And I, I know, I don't know the man, but I've heard Steve Bannon give speeches where he said, what brought you Donald Trump was the failure of the structure of the bailouts of the 2008-9 financial crisis that, that fed that's, the despair. That's, that's, that's got to be at least partly true because, again, what President Trump brought, and, you know, frankly, he's not alone. He has competitors on the left doing it, too, were walls, you know, very seductive right. stories that that's I right. can make the change go away. Mm -hmm. That, of course, isn't true, and it mm -hmm. isn't going to serve people's interests, but... You know, if the alternative is uh, an economist who simply says, trust me, the market will work, well, that's not making the sale either. Yeah. Well, in Detroit, right after, and my, my guests on this podcast have heard this before, but right after the 
nomination of Donald Trump, I believe it was in Cleveland in a convention, he went to the Detroit Economic Club and he wailed on the big three management for losing jobs in Michigan. And he said, this system is rigged. Now, the state of Michigan has obviously been through a lot, but all of my friends with graduate degrees, JDs, MBAs, CPAs, MDs, the whole thing, all voted for Trump because somebody's finally calling out this. Right. And they were disappointed in me because I didn't. I was at a dinner with them on election night in Detroit, as it turned out. And they said, Rob, you know, you brought up your family in New York and so forth. You don't understand how stagnant this is, et cetera. And then they were critical, obviously, of Obama's restructuring of the auto industry, albeit allowing plants to be built in China and Mexico with the money, protecting the white flight, as they called it, uh, upper, what you might call management service class, but not the manufacturing class. And there was a lot of discord. And they felt like Trump was the solution. I told them, well, I, at this dinner, I lost seven to one in terms of who I voted for. But I don't think you're going to be happy with the outcome. Because like well, you and, said, and he's, he's he'll, he'll, because... build, he'll build walls and he'll seduce and abandon. But he's not going to do the dynamism well, that we, is we, in your we know. We know, of course, it's an old story. I mean, again, this was the very story that got Smith angry enough to write The Wealth of Nations, mm. the, the uh, oh, canard yeah. of mercantilism that, you know, we just need to block out the other in trade and it'll help the domestic economy. Of course, yeah. nothing could be further from the truth. But, you know, if, if the uh, only counterpart to that argument is, you know, let her rip, which would be sort of the neoliberal version of the story, mm -hmm. I think that's a problem. We need to put the liberal back in neoliberal, i.e. Smith and the classical yeah. thinkers who yeah. did care a lot about mass flourishing and the dignity of every person, not just the most successful. Yeah, no, I mean, he had a, what I call a holistic view. And as you described, and, and I really enjoyed that part of your book, because when I'm asking myself, what are walls? Your, which am I called, passage through mercantilism and how Smith saw beyond it was very important. It was very illuminating as to what you meant and what we shouldn't be doing. Well, ironically, it was falling walls that got us into a lot of the modern mess. It was, you know, the collapse of the Berlin Wall, the so called death of distance. <laughs> The uh, you know yeah. lower cost of transportation, communication, all these are good things, but suddenly they made the economy hyper competitive at a time when we really had not prepared people for that competition. Mm -hmm. And so our only solution was either tiny little programs like trade adjustment assistance or ultimately just saying, well, we'll pension you off or put you on disability. None of that plays to the dignity. Nobody wants that. Right. But they want to be part of a of a society. And yeah. unless and until we do that, we're not going to have broad social support for the system. And we shouldn't be surprised uh, yeah. if we don't. I've spent a lot of time, uh, I, I went into the private sector in 1989 and was involved in the hedge fund industry. And for a number of years, I ran the non-Japan Asia portfolio for George Soros. In that process, uh, at, just after Tiananmen Square, I got very involved in visiting and dialogue that I, that's always gone on. And what's really interesting to me is when Donald Trump came into power, a number of the Chinese leaders, and I'm talking not, I don't even met Xi Jinping, but all the next layer, would say to me confidentially, I'm watching this guy demonize Mexico and China, but it's, was, we, they said, they were very coherent about this. We had one 40th of the per capita income of Americans at the starting gate, say 1979, 1980. Deng Xiaoping comes in, we're transforming. We're four times the size of the American population. It is going to be, the globalization, the integration on our two sides is going to be changing relative prices, sectors, and so on, profoundly. But it wasn't within our power, meaning the Chinese, 
to create that transitional sectoral movement, assistance, support, education, and the anger that is now directed at us is something we could, uh, we understand where it is, but it was the responsibility of American elite governments to handle that transformation. And well, I think that's actually very insightful and true. And that ball was dropped, and it's not a partisan comment. It was dropped by Democrats. It was dropped oh, yeah. by oh, yeah. Republicans. Oh. You know, people think of Republicans as being the champions here, but you know, no one was more neoliberal than Bill Clinton. Mm -hmm. who talked about globalization as being like the rain. You know, you can't stop that. I think Tony Blair said something to the effect of it's like autumn following summer. You know, it's mm -hmm. just, it is what it is, which is a kind of hands-off, we're not going to help you, every person for himself or herself, and that doesn't work. You know, China in its transition was heavily influenced um, by Janos Kornai oh, yeah. in trying to... Um, gently wean away the state sector. So when uh, Deng Xiaoping opened up the economy, there was a more gradual incremental change rather than what today we might call shock therapy, to use the Russian or Eastern European mm -hmm. uh, example. And I think it benefited China. And in the U.S., you could have imagined a system that used um, maybe very large wage credits for a period of time or things that would give firms a transition as people move from one industry or type of work to another. But of course, we, we didn't do any of that. Yeah. Well, I, I'm really inspired by what you just said, because there, there are people like Julian Gurwitz, who wrote the book about Cornoy and the transformation, and, you know, people from Milton Friedman to James Tobin and everybody were involved. And then people like the, uh, she, she was born in Germany, the scholar Isabel Weber, they are talking about a transformation process in China that's neither state alone or markets alone, but it did have a social awareness. And, and the reason I'm underscoring that right now is I don't have a, I have a lot of fear of some of the things that Chinese leadership thinks are legitimate to do. But in that realm of economic adjustment, there are lessons to learn in how they transform themselves in a way where, uh, I mean, it wasn't like you said, shock treatment, like, like Corna, don't just let it go and let everything collapse and then rebuild the wreckage. They created a transformation, a transition that's not unlike the challenge we probably have to make right now related to fossil well, fuels and other things. You know, that's the thing, you know, it's, it's fine to go back and say, well, we had the issues with um, the steel industry or manufacturing generally, but, you know, there are at least two major challenges confronting us. One is on artificial intelligence, which is probably the latest general purpose technology, perhaps along with another robotics that could completely change the nature of work. For many more Americans, including some Americans who would consider themselves very skilled, maybe even somewhat professional mm -hmm. uh, people, the other is climate change, which is probably one of the big social problems of our age. Both of those call for innovation. Both of them call for perhaps at least looking at where the boundary is between the market and the state. And both would benefit from the Lincolns and Roosevelts of the world saying, yes. what's a way that I could um, use what I have in power as kind of a battering ram to open up opportunity for people in this transition and then let the private sector work out that transition as efficiently as it, as it can. Mm -hmm. let's, let's talk a little bit. Uh, I think I've mentioned to you at times that... Uh, In, in our preparation for this, that a lot of times people treat the market and the state like they're separable domains. There's a lot of concern now about the role of money in politics, which you might call, I, I've used this phrase in previous part, the commodification of social design and enforcement. And I'm very uh, nervous that at times there is no uh, 
sense of what you might call the incentives of governance that allow it to represent the we rather than the donors. So while I see exactly the pathway that you're, uh, I would say, putting into the mix with the markets, how do we allow that governance to shape things in a way that's, that is for, for the moral purpose of the collective? Well, you know, this is one of those where, and I could be very naive, not being a politician, where the right thing looks like a political winner. If you do think more collectively about everybody in the same boat, then it becomes easier to think about a policy of uh, a different kind of approach to community colleges or to federal aid that helps communities. All of that should be uh, all of that should be possible. So I I think this is actually a winner, uh, not a loser in the political process, particularly up against the neoliberal vision of let it rip, but also against the vision of let's build walls around the country. I just don't think it worked. So Glenn, when, when we're talking about how to build bridges, and there's been such little trust in government, there's concern about capture and so forth, what, what historical, what you might call, uh, experiences would you point to, to give people a guiding light as to how to do it again. I know you talked about Lincoln and, and you talked about Franklin Roosevelt. How did they jump start confidence in them? And, and what can we learn from that now? Well, Roosevelt's a great place to start, Rob. You know, people normally think about the Roosevelt of the early New Deal, but I think apropos of the bridge, more the Roosevelt of the GI Bill and the huge uh, desire to reintegrate returning service people into a dynamic economy. The same was true of the big Lincoln era reforms. You know, doing the right thing of using government as a battering ram, really, to make sure everybody has the ability to compete, to use Smith's terms, is the right answer. And I think it's not that people, quote, trust government or don't, quote, trust government. It's a matter, is government using its energies to empower people or to frustrate them? If it's in power, mm -hmm. that trust will come. So at this juncture, let's look, let's look on the horizon at climate change. I know the technology issues, but how do you see coming down the path? Let, let's just say President Biden or his successor brought you back into the White House. What are, what are the pieces? I know, you know, from reading your book, there's private sector engagement, understanding, there's government setting incentives, there's transformational support for the population so they go along with the plan. But give us the vision of how you would be if you were the czar of achieving climate change and perhaps add a little international collaboration in because this isn't just an American problem, it's, it's a global problem. Well, it's a great question. You know, climate change, like artificial intelligence, will be one of the forces that shapes and transitions our workforce, our economy, our public policy, and our well-being, frankly, for decades to come. I think what government can do is, first, in the case of climate change, put a price on carbon. If we want business to do what it does best, which is innovate different solutions, it needs a price on carbon to do that. But government can't simply do that and then assume that everything else will take care of itself. That would be repeating the same mistakes of globalization and technological change and forgetting people in transition. So there's still a large role in place-based aid and individual assistance to help people get ready uh, for that new economy. We're certainly up to that. We've done it at other transitions and turning points in our economy, and we could certainly do it again. Climate change, in a sense, offers a tailor-made example because it involves a tax, putting a price on carbon, 
it also offers some of the funds that might be needed yeah. for exactly I know, uh, that. I know people purpose. like uh, the economist James Boyce have talked about a carbon dividend where the angst of the body politic can be offset a little bit by using some of the proceeds to assure them that they won't be devastated or left behind. But the, uh, I, I would also say we really need that engineering expertise related to the new technologies that are necessary. And then the final, the final piece that lots of people are knocking on my door about that I'm, I'm curious of your perspective is they're saying, let's just use Africa as an example. Africa is an equatorial region, can benefit a great deal from solar power. But the risk premium people pay for private investment on that continent is very high. Should we be creating governmental guarantees to put those, in other words, any default risk premiums or, or, or fear of the integrity of their capital markets, should we all bear that together because we're all going to receive benefits if they do realize that climate change uh, technology? Well, you know, that's a that's actually a difficult question. I would think before doing that, one wants to make sure you have the kind of governance of projects and economies that make sure mm -hmm. that you're getting the right investment. But yes, you know, one of the things that's got to be true, not just of climate change, but frankly, the pandemic, rich countries have to realize yep. that we are all in this together. When you're talking about the pandemic or climate change, there's no America-only pandemic or America-only problem with climate change. So some kind of transfers have to happen. I, I like to think of them as mainly being in the technology area or in the case of the pandemic uh, vaccines, that this is an area where we have a responsibility. Mm -hmm. And frankly, it helps us 